welcome to the Hillsdale Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle Mernon, Director of Online Learning at Hillsdale College. I'm Juan Davalos. I'm the Director of Marketing for Online Learning. And we're here today because we're starting this podcast on the online courses. Over 10 years ago, we decided to take everything that we teach here at the college, the core things that we teach to our students here at Hillsdale, Michigan, and put them online for everybody who wishes to learn. And now we're doing the same, taking it a step further, making them available to you in this podcast. And we're going to start today with the Second World Wars. And I'm really excited to be able to start with this seven-part series on the Second World Wars. And it's for two primary reasons. The first are the people that you're going to learn from in this series. It's taught by Dr. Larry Piarn, the president of Hillsdale College, and by Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, distinguished teaching fellow in history at Hillsdale College. And what the course does is it unpacks the main arguments from Dr. Hansen's book on the Second World Wars. And that's the second reason why I think this is such a great thing to do. The subject in particular can be overwhelming, right? There are so many people, places, facts, figures, dates, when you approach this war that you can often get lost, get overwhelmed by the sheer quantity. And what Dr. Hansen does that's really unique is instead of approaching it in a strict chronology, he starts to explain the main themes of the war. What are the ways in which the allied powers approached the war that were different from the Axis powers? And what were the key strategies that led to allied success and Axis failure? And how can we understand that? And so today we're going to go ahead and start with lecture one, which is taught by Dr. Larry P. Arn. And Dr. Arn is going to talk about the stakes of World War II. One of the striking things about this lecture is his talk on totalitarianism. And, and that's really what was at stake here. He starts by saying a new word was invented in this time period, and it's totalitarianism. And it's not different in substance to the old concept of tyranny. And so Dr. Arn compares the two and, and sees how this totalitarianism rising in Europe is, is absolutely corrupting. It, it affects all of society. It destroys the family. One of the striking samples he gives is how children are taught to snitch on their parents and, and their neighbors. And so there is no trust in society. Everything breaks down. And if you like what you heard in today's podcast, uh, there's plenty more learning content where that came from. You can go to hillsdale.edu slash course and sign up for one of our more than 40 free online courses today. Without further ado, here's Dr. Arn. Hello, uh, welcome to this course entitled The Second World Wars. My name is Larry Arn. I'm the president of Hillsdale College and I teach politics and history here. And I'm going to introduce this course by introducing Victor Hansen, who's going to teach it, and by summarizing the Second World War and by talking about the stakes in that war. Uh, Victor Hansen is a great man, a friend of mine for many years now, one of the most important scholars of our time. He's a classic scholar, and then like really great scholars do, he has extended deep knowledge of that all over the place. He got to focusing on military history pretty early in the classical world. He's master of those languages he built or greatly helped to build the classics department at University of California, Fresno. So by study and teaching, he deepened his knowledge of those things. And now, once you understand the fundamentals, you can understand other things too. And he's written about all kinds of things, including this book on the Second World War, greatest of all the wars. And uh, I hope you enjoy him. You should read his book because it might be his greatest achievement, and that would really be saying something. He's a distinguished fellow at Hillsdale College since 2004. Since about that time, he's been the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution in California, a great place. And he's a fifth-generation farmer, and uh, he's proud of that, and he loves that life And uh, because I've been around there quite a bit now. I know that uh, the people who work and thrive in the greatest farming area on the planet, just love this guy. And that's a slightly different crowd than you'll meet at, say, any fancy university. So, interesting guy. You should learn about him. Now, the Second World War is the biggest war. It started, it, it's kind of hard to say when it started. Uh, Hitler started making mischief from January 1933 when he became the Chancellor of Germany. And Japan was uh, making war on their neighbors from about that time, earlier even, in Asia. 
But the war in Europe, the, the thing that erupted into the worldwide thing, started on September 3rd, 1939, when uh, the, the, German, the Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Britain had given a guarantee of the security of Poland. It had failed to give that guarantee to easier to reach and stronger Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia fell, and then they turned to Poland, and Britain did go into war with Hitler because of his invasion of Poland, and France followed. And uh, the Soviet Union was at that moment an ally of Hitler. Uh, Victor makes an insightful point that I had never thought of before in his book, and that is that uh, the Soviet Union is the only major country that was an ally of every other major country in the World War. And that complicates a little bit understanding it because... These great modern totalitarian nations are on both sides of the question. Uh, but I think there's a theme anyway that we can discover despite that. France fell in June of 1940 very fast. Well, there was a phony war. So September 1939 until very early May 1940, there wasn't much fighting to the West. Hitler and Stalin were carving up Poland and Stalin was taking Finland. So there wasn't a lot happened in the West. Uh, Neville Chamberlain was, he was the prime minister of Great Britain, was lulled into a false sense of security about all that. And then come the 10th of May, 1940, so a few months later after the beginning of the war, the German war machine turned West. Did it by a very innovative way, differently than they did it in the First World War. And uh, on that day, uh, on the, uh, it's the 10th of May when that, attack began. On the 8th and 9th of May, the British government had been falling. And on the 10th of May, Churchill was pretty much appointed prime minister. He assumed that office formally on the 13th of May. So in May 1940, Britain and France and, and Belgium and lots of countries in Western Europe come under attack. And by the middle of June, six weeks later, mighty France, a major nation, was simply overcome. And uh, you could see by late May that that was going to happen, and the British Army was busy trying to get away at Dunkirk, which they mostly did, not with their heavy weapons, however. And so Churchill comes into a world of hurt. And the effect of all that is by a very narrow decision that makes the glory of, uh, in the story of Winston Churchill, you should watch the movie Darkest Hour or read the really great accounts of it in several books. I'll mention two, Martin Gilbert's one volume, Churchill, A Life, or John Lucas, that film, Darkest Hour, was mainly, uh, mostly made from his book, Five Days in London. Those are great books. And you'll see that Churchill did marvels. Britain decided to stay in the war. And so you've got little Britain against Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, except there's no active hostilities between them, from uh, late May 1940 until June 1941, when Hitler attacks his ally, the Soviet Union, tries to overcome it and reduce it to servitude and destroy its, <laughs> many of its people. So now Britain's not alone anymore. They're in alliance with a movement and a nation that Churchill deplores. But he said once, if Hitler invaded hell, I would at least make a favorable mention of the devil in the House of Commons. So they're leagued up, right? And then things change in December 1941 because the Japanese attacked us in Pearl Harbor. And then in an astonishing development, Germany, Hitler, declared war on us. Nothing going on between us directly, but he declared war on us. And so now we're in the war. And that changed everything. Churchill thought the war was going to be won for sure once that happened. And uh, the Japanese continued to make mischief and win victories in, in the Far East into 1943, more than a year later. And they sort of slowed down after that. But the danger was they were going to take Australia as well as all that they did take, which included the Philippines. And they took the Dutch possessions where the oil was. So you really do have a world war everywhere. There was fighting off the coast of Antarctica. And the British built several bases there. So it's everywhere, right? And that had never really happened before. And it begins to turn in late 1942, 43. 
the British begin and the Americans begin to win in North Africa, and then and they take Italy in 43, or they take uh, Sicily and parts of Italy in 43. And in the Battle of Stalingrad was, a, you know, the uh, Victor writes, the greatest casualties in history. And that turned in 42. And then after that, the Soviet Union was on the offensive. And the costs were massive, but from Churchill calls this the uh, this period in uh, the hinge of fate. After they finally won a battle in North Africa, and in and in the East at Stalingrad, they just kept winning after that. Although most of the casualties came after that, so it was huge, and it went on for years. And Britain was not alone anymore. And uh, and the Allies agreed to put the. Uh, it, it's amazing how mighty they were. Victor does a great job describing that in his book. The Allies, the Soviet Union, the, Britain, and the United States agreed to deal with Japan second, which was a big thing for the United States, and I think wise, but a selfless thing too, because it was Japan that had attacked the United States first. And so they won the war in Europe. Uh, they invaded, uh, they opened a second front in Europe in June of 1944, and then a they did that again in Marseille in August of 1944. And meanwhile, the Soviet Union was making progress. By early 45, it was just a question of even late 44, when were the Germans going to collapse? And they did collapse in early May of 45. And then the Japanese, after the dropping of two atomic bombs, an incredible, Victor makes the point, more effective bombing of Japanese cities uh, through 44 and 45, 43, 44, and 45, they were reduced to rubble. And so Jap Japan, the war ended in September 1945. Uh, so my main job is to explain the stakes of the war. Well, what's all this about? Why did this terrible thing happen? What fueled it and sustained it? What, was, what depended on the outcome? And uh, I'll summarize what I think about that under two headings, in ascending order of importance, death and life. First of all, death. Victor's probably going to tell you about that. He summarizes that better than I've ever seen. About 60 million people were killed in the war, about half of them soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and about half of them civilians. Uh, that's, that's, you know, three times as much as the First World War. The body count is just massive. And then a lot of it comes from a new way of killing people. Because the war, there, there are big reasons why the war is so severe for civilians. First of all, because technology and accumulated wealth make it possible to wage a more total kind of war even than was waged in the First World War, which was incredibly terrible and unprecedented. And then the second thing is... There was a mass-produced, organized effort to murder people, whole categories of people, whole races of people, whole professions of people. And that had actually been going on some before the war, except not in factories. Stalin actually organized to starve the people of a region, and millions were starved to death. And he did it just by taking the crops that were farmers and sending them off somewhere else and not leaving them with any food. And the Russian winter was coming. And uh, that's because they disagreed with him about how to farm. So it, it had become a thing that we're going to destroy whole categories of people. Hitler built factories that were disguised, from, at least Auschwitz, the most famous of them, was uh, sort of configured to look like an oil something from the sky. The Nazis tried to hide this, which means that they knew that it was a questionable thing to do. Although they thought they were going to have world domination, they didn't proclaim that they were doing this, but they did do it. And they killed about six million Jews, most of them in these factories, because they tried many other ways to kill them. And they weren't just Jews. They were all kinds of enemies of Hitler, but they were in the main Jews. And they, uh, they found that shooting them took too long and made the troops upset, and uh, they found that putting them in the back of a car, a truck, and closed back, back of a truck, and funneling the emissions from the truck back into the, into the 
the back so that the people would be suffocated. That took too long. So there's, you know, they, they were scientific about it. And, you know, you can find uh, Martin Gilbert, for whom I used to work and who's a great man and whose papers are here now and we're completing the Churchill biography here at the college that he began and that I got to work with him on for some years. He wrote a lot about the Holocaust. And one thing, and I helped with some of that, and one thing, it's an amazing thing to do, but uh, you can hold in your hand a document where the German army people are having an argument with the Gestapo about what gets shipping priority. Is it going to be weapons and food for our troops, or is it going to be Jews sent to the death camps? And the Gestapo argued for the Jews getting more priority, and they often won those arguments. It's a huge operation, right? And um, nobody had ever seen anything like that before. When it emerged in in 1944, late 1944, when they discovered those camps, it was hard to believe. There was news had come at the camps in the middle of, in the second half of 1944. I think the month was in August. Two guys got away from Auschwitz and uh, escaped, managed to get across Europe and ended up in Jerusalem. And when they told their story, it was very difficult for anybody to believe it. A man named Heim Weizmann, who was a good friend of Winston Churchill's, took the story to Churchill. And his first request of Churchill was, go verify this, because it's a shocker. And uh, we, you know, there are a lot of press reports, which we have in our archive, which I've read, of the discovery of these camps. And this is after this incredible war and all this carnage, and people are still astonished by this. So something new is going on. Uh, the body counts are higher than ever. And there's an organized attempt at mass slaughter. And it's the biggest in history. And it changes the world in huge ways. And it was just more killing than anybody ever saw. It's made possible by things that live. And I want to turn to the question of life. Because it's actually true that unless someone is insane, they are very unlikely to live for the sake of murder. They're more likely to murder for the sake of what they believe in or love. And there were new kinds of things like that. And that's one reason why the war was so virulent. The technology had changed. And so this, there's an ancient, the, the greatest political science started with and in my opinion, continues among few people. Victor Hansen's one of them. Some other people who teach at Hillsdale College are among them. Starts with the classics when they begin to study the regimes. And the worst of all the kinds of regimes is tyranny. And tyranny is a regime where uh, the rule is in the interest of the ruler. And that means that uh, the others are held by force. They're in greater or lesser states of rebellion all the time. In uh, the 20th century, a new word was... uh, invented for tyranny. And it was invented in response to the emergence of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. They called it totalitarianism. The communists were particularly good at this, but the Nazis too. Uh, Actually, I'll start with them. First time I met Martin Gilbert, he was in a little library in London called the Wiener Library, and it's full of Nazi literature run by some Jewish people who got that literature out so people could understand the Nazi regime. And he was looking at a uh, primary school book, a little color book. And it was the story of some German children with their blonde hair and blue eyes going into, it's a primer, it's a young, young, early school book. And they go into a butcher's shop and the butcher is a Jew and the butcher looks like Bluto in the Popeye movies. And uh, he's got coarse beard and he's swarthy and he's fat. He's got a undershirt on that doesn't look attractive on him. I remember this, and Martin Gilbert pointed out to me that the colors of the skin of this Jewish butcher was uh, like the colors of the sides of pork, pork hanging in this butcher shop. And the story that unfolds is that this butcher is attempting to attract these kids in the back so he can kill them. And uh, that's, you know, an odd thing to teach young children, but that's the kind of thing they taught them. Julius Stryker was the guy in charge of all that. (laughs) 
Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, and eight to one student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Well, in the Soviet Union, what what happens, right? Your kids have to go to school. If they don't, you're arrested. But then what are they taught in school? They're taught to inform on you. People live in terror of their own children because the children are young, right? And they can't. And so they go to school and they hear, you know, authoritative things. And you'd be afraid to tell the children not to believe what's in school, because how can you trust a 10-year-old not to repeat what you said? And to the extent that you can teach them things like that, you are depriving them of their childhood. That's totalitarianism. And that grew up. And it was very ambitious, they thought. And, and see, don't, I don't want you to think that, because uh, I, I don't think, I don't think one should think, I'll put it this way, that this was just because people love cruelty. Uh, they do. This kind of person does. But more, they thought that they could just make everything perfect or really great. They could get rid of all trouble. You could stop class oppression, or you could make the Aryan race into the great people that genetics and history intends them to be. And you can arrive at an age that will be the greatest, most perfect possible human age. And for that good, you have to get rid of a lot of stuff. And you have to be ruthless about it, justified by the good that you want. And in the case of the Soviet Union, you have to get rid of people's attachment to their property and their faith. And in Germany, actually the same thing. Germany was a socialist state, but also racial things in the German way. Churchill actually thought that communism was uh, ultimately more dangerous. I mean, to be ultimately more dangerous than Adolf Hitler is to be very dangerous. But uh, he thought it was ultimately more dangerous because its appeal could be more widespread. These people who just go to promote the Aryans, whoever they are, I mean, Hitler himself didn't look like an Aryan. And so it's not likely to be terribly attractive to uh, for example, Germany's ally, Japan. So those things are there, right? And those are arguments about a way of living. And they're arguments about the nature of human beings. They're making claims about that. They're saying that human beings are things that are sh shaped by their circumstances in decisive ways, the circumstances of their race or the circumstances of their class. And both of those things, the economic class is what communism focuses on, and both of those things are products of time. That's why they're called variants of historicism. And so they think that if you could just get control of that process, you could do anything you wanted to with the world. And those things were aggressive in their home countries, but they were like uh, the, the, the people who may, and you, you have to see, the Soviet Union itself was a product of the First World War because the leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution were exiled in Zurich, having next to nothing to do with events in the Soviet Union, and the Germans decided to pick them up and give them safe passage and inject them into Petersburg, is where they went, and see if they can't just tear the heck out of Russia and get them out of the war czarist Russia. And, uh, you know, Churchill writes that they were injected like a plague bacillus in a sealed train. 
And uh, it was like that. And they did destroy czarist Russia and the Kerensky-led fledgling representative democracy that was being built. And they built this thing that came from the First World War. And that's not the only sense in which the Second World War came from the First World War. The destruction of the czar, the destruction of the Kaiser, the replacement with things that didn't command loyalty much, except right away in the Soviet Union, command loyalty is exactly what it did. The Weimar Republic in Germany didn't do that. So you have this thing that grows out of war, and it gives rise to the kind of regime that hadn't really been seen before. I don't myself think that it's really different in principle than ancient tyranny, which is also at war with human nature. Uh, the classic books raise the question, uh, how can a tyrant perpetuate himself? Because they don't last very long, these tyrannies. People don't like them. And a uh, famous story repeated by Aristotle that they do it by uh, lopping off everything tall, everything excellent, everything superior. A tyrant stands in a field of grain and lops off all the top higher heads of grain. And that point, you can't have friendship, you can't have philosophy, you can't have faith, because those are all things that look both closer inside the human being, not just to the tyrant, and look above the tyrant too. And Hitler and Stalin, just like, you know, the great Greek tyrants and the Roman ones, they suppress everything private and everything high. Except now what changes is the scale is so much bigger. And it becomes plausible that you could actually remake the world. And then the use of technology makes it ever more potentially intense. And so that's what's at stake. Which way are we going to live? Whose claims are right? So you get a tremendous spectacle in this war because, you know, one of the most articulate and, to my mind, finest human beings who ever lived was Winston Churchill, who was a friend of freedom, parliamentary democracy, freedom under a constitution, freedom with restraint. Every person he loved to quote can live by no man's leave beneath the law, however humble that person is born. The government is to be accountable to the people. Churchill said that there's always two questions, and one is two options, and one is one question and two options. Are the people going to belong to the government, or is the government going to belong to the people? He just repeated that all his life, and he thought that these great totalitarian tyrannies, which he thought that the extremist movements in his own country, including the Socialist Party that he opposed all his life and was beaten by in 1945, echoed in a milder form the same thing as these tyrannies. Because they too had this sort of notion that we can perfect the society if we just assemble more power in the people who lead it. Much milder, though. He was always careful to make that distinction. But in the case of these Nazis and the Japanese, you know, who had a kind of racial purification idea going on in an explicit program for Asia. And in the case of the Soviet Union, they were going to perfect the society and they were going to have the courage, as they styled it. They could, uh, one of their favorite things to say, the Bolsheviks was, Bolshevism can conquer any mountain because there's nothing it won't do to get to the top. And so once you start doing that to your own people, what's the war going to be like? Because now you're killing others. And uh, it was fierce. The Germans in the East just killed a lot more people than they needed to for military purposes. And the Soviets had already done that to their own people and did it then later to the places that they conquered. So... It is a great contest, and it's confused by, uh, between these two ways of looking at the world, right? And they really do amount to whether you have a picture of the human soul that it's free and therefore entitled to govern itself, which means never to be governed except with its consent, different then from horses and dogs and all the things that we use for pets, or this view that, no, 
in the end, we're collective beings shaped by history. And now we're going to appoint some of us to get in control of the effort to shape history. And those two things are in contention, although the Soviet Union, which is one of the foremost representatives of this totalitarianism, shifted sides, promised friendship to the West. We're finishing the official biography of Winston Churchill by finishing the last six volumes of documents. There'll be eventually 23. In fact, next year we intend to finish. I think we can. 23 volumes of documents and eight volumes of narrative. So a 31 big document biography, the biggest ever done. Started in 1962 by Winston Churchill. And we're doing right now the documents for the last half of the Second World War. And now I'm in the one, we're in the one because I'm happy to be working on it right now. I'm in the one for after the war and Churchill. And then the last one will be about Churchill's second premiership in peacetime in 51 and on. And so what do you find in those documents? You find that Churchill understood that despite the fact that the Soviet Union was an ally, if it conquered, if it was the thing that liberated from Hitler Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe was going to fall under a different kind of totalitarianism, which makes different claims in powerful respects, but which Churchill thought uh, differ, as they like to say, as the North Pole differs from the South. They look rather alike, don't they, even if they're poles apart. So he started trying in 1943 to get every step taken that he could conceive of to get the Western countries to conquer as much land farther to the east as they could, and that involved a strategy of south and east across Africa and then up into across the Mediterranean, the underside of Europe. And a lot of that was done, and enough was done to uh, save Italy and Greece and therefore also Turkey from communism, which later formed one of the flanks of NATO. And uh, not enough was done to save Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia. By the skin of its teeth, Austria was saved. So it was a tragic ending to the war. And what that means is the war did not provide a final resolution to these questions. And indeed, the Soviet Union has fallen, and it's a different kind of despotism today, and in my opinion, uh, less virulent. I mean, I even think that's obvious. It just doesn't appear to kill nearly as many people and or to exercise so comprehensive a control over everyone. Bad thing, though, it'd be. But, uh, you know, communism is powerful and growing, and uh, the arrangements of the world that follow this great war, are still affected by the outcome of that war. You know, the peace treaty that ended World War II was, maybe it was signed in 1991, I think, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And so the stakes are the stakes of human freedom, which depends upon a view of human nature and the government that's appropriate to that. And that battle still goes on. And uh, I'll close with this. Um, I have something to read from Churchill. This thing I'm going to read is about the Soviet Union, written in 1935, but it could be about Nazi Germany just the same. He wrote similar things about it. He says, uh, The communist theme aims at universal standardization. The individual becomes a function. The community is alone of interest. Mass thoughts dictated and propagated by the rulers are the only thoughts deemed respectable. No one is to think of himself as an immortal spirit, clothed in the flesh, but sovereign, unique, indestructible. No one is to think of himself even as that harmonious integrity of mind, soul, and body, which, take it as you will, may claim to be the Lord of creation. Isn't that pretty, by the way? Not very many people can write like that. And among statesmen, subhuman goals and ideals are set before these Asiatic millions. The beehive know 
for there must be no queen and no honey, at least no honey for others. In Soviet Russia, we have a society which seeks to model itself upon the ant. Not one single social or economic principle or concept in the philosophy of the Russian Bolshevik is present that has not been realized and carried into action and enshrined in immutable laws a million years ago by the white ant. It produces people to insects. But you know, Churchill was a very hopeful man, and I don't know anything he ever wrote that ends on a note like that. And that particular note in an essay called Mass Effects in Modern Life is immediately followed by one of the most hopeful things he ever wrote. He says, human nature is more intractable than ant nature. It means harder to change. The explosive variations of its phenomenon disturb the smooth working out of the laws and forces which have subjugated the white ant. It is at once the safeguard and the glory of mankind that they are easy to lead and hard to drive. Can't you see? It's a completely different picture of the human being. Those, the contrast between those, how we are to live and why we are to think we should live that way. And you know, life is more important than death. That's why we honor and celebrate those who give up their lives so that others may have a better life. You see, and that difference between the white ant and the divinely inspired being that is easy to lead and hard to drive, the difference between those are the stakes of the Second World Wars. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses podcast. If you want to continue learning about World War II or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu forward slash course. There you can find over 40 free online courses, including American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hansen, C.S. Lewis on Christianity, Ancient Christianity, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening. <laughs>